the idea that we're making policy and thinking about politics in a world where there's an unchanging group of them who are getting all the benefits, who never contribute, and a bigger group equally unchanging of us who get nothing out of the system and who pay all the money is um, a huge misrepresentation. So this is the Chancellor um, talking um, in June 2013. Two groups need to be satisfied with our welfare system. Those who need it, who've lost their job and who we as a compassionate society want to support. And there's a second group, the people who pay for this system, who go out to work, who pay their taxes and expect it to be fair on them too. The um, description of three generations in a family that have never worked. And um, somebody even spotted a reference to six generation families that have never worked, which um, some of them may have their pictures on the wall, I guess if you're <laughs> affluent enough. Um, so of every 100 people who sign on to Job Seekers Allowance, how many are still on Job Seekers Allowance after a year? Um, these are some DWP numbers on how long people actually stay getting Job Seekers Allowance. But this is what it looked like uh, before the crisis in April 2007. After a year, about 7% of people were still on Job Seekers Allowance. Now, of course, that's changed with the crisis. Even post-crisis, of the 100 people going on to Job Seekers Allowance, half stay on it for no more than two months, and only 10% stay on for as long as a year. Let me take another side of this, which is our impressions of where the money is spent. My annual tax summary, and therefore my income tax and national insurance, is now being beamed around the country. This is a statement to me of where my money goes. And it's actually quite helpful. Um, of my taxes, 198 pounds went as my contribution to the EU budget. State pensions are there, and that means only the basic state pension, then education, then health, and then this enormous orange blob, a quarter of my money is going on welfare. Now, what isn't made clear in the notes that HMRC sent me was that, that includes judges' pensions, it includes all personal care for the elderly, it includes child benefit going to everybody, it includes benefits going to sick and disabled people, it includes tax credits for people who are working. It is not going on our image of welfare in the sense of handouts. This is an alternative way of showing it, the same thing. Actually, two-thirds goes on the welfare state. That's including the NHS, education, personal social services, and social security. On the other hand, if you mean out-of-work benefits, cash payments for people who aren't of pension age, actually, the orange triangle should only be 5%. And if you mean unemployment benefits and housing benefits for people getting job seekers allowance, it's actually only 1% of public spending. So if you look at the numbers, the welfare debate is around payments to um, people who are out of work of working age. That's only one pound out of every 12 pounds 50 we spend on the welfare state. And actually of that pound, only 20 pence is going on unemployment benefits and associated housing benefits. But that's where the debate is. We run from the idea that we're spending this very large amount of money on public spending, two thirds of that on the welfare state, to the idea that it must be going to these handouts to this other, other group of people. Isn't it a great week for John to be making many of those points? You know, it's the week that started with policy-free spin, which was along the lines that said to benefit claimants, oi, you fat, get off the sofa. There's no policy, there's no real idea about how to make this idea of tackling obesity a reality. It's pure pre-election spin, pure uh, divide and rule uh, myth, them and us. If you do a careful calculus of um, where uh, welfare spending goes and you look at as people change over the life cycle, then what you see in reality of the figures rather than in the myth is that the welfare state is something which is not just there for an underclass minority, as it were, but for the middling majority, which is going to need it at some point or other. There'll be a pinch point where you need it. And that pinch point might come, you know, after a divorce, it might come on falling sick or when you've got to take time out of work to look after an ailing uh, relative. Or indeed, it might happen if the good times suddenly stop to roll for everyone, as happened in spectacular fashion, of course, after the crisis in 2008. Now, the whole community then, in 2008, had great to, uh, reason to be grateful for the, for the safety net, including very many people who never fell back on it directly. And that's because of the protection that Social Security provided 
for the purchasing power across the economy as a whole. So whether we were claiming benefits or not, we had reason to be grateful for it at that point. Benefit cuts and the ones that are in prospect now are really beginning to hurt working Britain too. Now, this is true both directly, because so much of working Britain now needs tax credits and housing benefit uh, to top them up. But it's also true because of the um, indirect effect on uh, terms and conditions that's starting to become evident, like this guy John MacArthur, who's an intelligent 59-year-old man with a rich CV in a depressed area of Scotland. He was ordered recently by the Job Centre to go back to his old job, he'd been laid off previously, now he was told he had to go back and do it as a volunteer, working unpaid. Now, when you hear stories like that, you begin to understand why it is that the latest econometric analysis, people like Richard Blundell at UCL and Paul Gregg at Bath, are starting to acknowledge seriously the effect that welfare reforms are now exerting on terms and conditions across the workforce as a whole. Because if John MacArthur's being told he has to go and do the same job he used to have to do without a wage and other people are feeling they can't get by even for a short period on reduced benefits, then there's going to be what MacArthur himself calls a conscript army at the door of many employers. Um, and that is at some point soon enough going to start to affect um, working people as well as the workless. Transcending the artificial divide imposed between the welfare them and the, the rest of us who are in work. <laughs>